I have to say at the beginning that this is uh, a, a small chapter uh, and right now a kind of closed chapter of art history and uh, I hope that it will bring back some of this, some of what happened in the 50s that has been obscured by other things that happened in the 50s and since then. On the right is the storeroom in Richard Stankiewicz's Broadway studio around 1957. And on the left is a photograph by Herbert Matter of Alexander Calder's Connecticut studio in the 1940s. Is, can you hear all right? Is that okay? All right. Um, the following is David Smith's short list of what he required to have it at hand to start a new sculpture. Stocks of bolts, nuts, taps, dyes, paints, solvents, protective coatings, oils, grinding, grinding wheels, polishing discs, dry pigments, waxes, chemicals, spare machine parts, four foot by eight foot sheets of stainless steel, bronze, copper, and aluminum, castings, forgings, rivets, welding, and brazing torches, shrink fits, all used because of their respective efficiency in arriving at a functioning object. He made this list about 1950 for Elaine de Kooning, who was writing an article uh, on him. This was even before he started doing you know, gigantic pieces. Um, for the tran transformation of the above into what is called sculpture, there was one essential, oops, sorry. essential ingredient, fire. Stolen before time by Prometheus from the gods. Fire, here seen as the flame from Ibram Lasso's oxyacetylene torch. Used for melting and fusing different metals, his torch would have been useful for the medieval alchemist aspiring to turn base metal into gold. And indeed, when assigned to write an article on Lasso, I visited his studio in 1954, and he was immersed in Jung's Psychology and Alchemy, a recently published volume in the Bollingen series of translations of Jung's complete works, in which the artist is uh, often equated with the alchemist. Herbert Reed, the distinguished British critic, called it scribbling in air. The Paris art dealer, Daniel Henry Conviler, used the words drawing in space to describe Picasso's experiments with welded metal. Clement Greenberg wrote of the cursiveness of Smith's drawing in air. And when Alexander Calder began to suspend cutouts of co colored metal on wire so that they slowly shifted in space, Marcel Duchamp coined the word mobile. Clearly the term sculpture, which derives from the Greek word meaning to carve, had become a misnomer when applied to artworks made up of pieces of metal assembled in space by industrial welding techniques. Since a generic term has yet to be uh, adopted to describe this partnership of solid and void, it is generally identified by the, the process, direct metal, the use of heat to assemble metal parts in thin air. The application of industrial technology to art was like the genie bursting out of confinement in this 1946 piece by Seymour Lipton, titled Genie, not the girl's name, the, the magic, whatever comes out of a magic lantern, a magical force that could produce something never before seen. Genies, as is known, sometimes get into mischief, Oops. Um, ignoring the master's wishes. Some might say that is what happened one night in 1960 in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art when Jean Tanguely displayed his homage to New York, a machine built to destroy itself. But we'll come back to that later. At the end of the 1920s, the welder's torch began to move from the factory into artists' workspaces, where it was used to bend, shape, and fasten metal sheets and rods into structures that often consisted more of line than mass. 
Around 1928, Picasso asked his old friend and, and compatriot, Julio Gonzalez, who had worked in an automobile factory during uh, the First World War, to help him assemble a woman's head out of wire. So Picasso went over to Gonzalez's uh, welding shack and uh, they put together this piece that's on the right-hand side. And then Gonzalez uh, decided he would, um, uh, he came, Gonzalez came from a family of Spanish iron workers and he decided to begin experimenting with seaming pieces of metal together to build the volumes of figures and went on to assemble pieces of metal in open form sculpture. This is a Gonzalez on the um, uh, left hand side, uh, although pieces that he became best known for are, are more open uh, uh, pieces of metal, you know, assembled in space. Um, John, the Russian-American artist John Graham brought several examples of Gonzalez's work back to the United States in the late 1920s and showed them to his friend David Smith, at that time a painter studying at the Art Students League with modernist Jan Matulka. Smith also saw those Picasso and Gonzalez works reproduced in Calle and by 1935, sculpture had taken precedence for him over painting, and the seeds of a new art form had passed through immigration. When a message, the three artists that I am going to uh, focus on um, are, I'll to introduce them quickly here, uh, Seymour Lipton, who was born in 1903, uh, who had a strong social consciousness and philosophical turn of mind, and imagery was of profound importance to him. Winter, uh, this is his um, sculpture called Winter Solstice, um, which is made of Monel metal. Uh, he shaped sheets of, sheets of Monel metal into configurations that seemed both open and closed, alternating gleaming textured surfaces and co containing dark hollows. Ibram Lasso, born in 1913, was committed to abstraction from the start and maintained that his work was not about communication, but a thing in itself. Uh, this is his sculpture, uh, Monoceros, uh, the whole thing and, and then a detail, which is in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, he di Lasso displaced solid form with open networks, which for him stood for the interrelatedness of all matter, organic and inorganic, the microcosm in the structure of an atom, the macrocosm in the solar system. Richard Stankiewicz, uh, was born in 1922, these are t each one 10 years apart, um, was of a generation for which the excitement of a new technology and the ideals of uh, formalist abstraction had given way to a more offhand approach and a more cynical attitude, typified in a way by the ri arrival of happenings in the late 50s. Using the ordinary, even the discarded, could have been seen as a mocking of some of the art world's growing pretensions. This is Aver, uh, Stankiewicz's aviary, an updated version of a twittering machine with flywheels suggesting fluttering wings. Um, his discarded machine parts were carefully chosen and assembled with structural expertise, but their irreverent humor and satire was something foreign to the high seriousness of the abstract expressionism that had dominated the 1950s. Two of these artists, uh, Lasso and Lipton were immediately given the official sanction of being included in the Museum of Modern Arts uh, 1951 milestone exhibition, Abstract Painting and Sculpture in America. Um, the museum's belated recognition that American art was worthy of its notice. They were quickly taken up by galleries and both were included in uh, Museum of Modern Art's 1956 12 Americans show, while the youngest, Tankevich, was featured in 16 Americans at MoMA a few years later. For all three, the 50s decade was a time of gallery exhibitions, sales, commissions, participation on panels, positive press, and invitations to teach or lecture. Before looking in detail at the work of these three sculptures, I, 
um, want to draw attention to several factors which were more or less significant in their formation. In New York in the 1940s, Not only were a number of surrealists present as refugees, but their work was frequently showcased, sometimes dramatically, like Giacometti's Woman with Her Throat Cut, reposing on a freeform pedestal in Peggy Guggenheim's Art of This Century Gallery, where many artists would have seen it. The presence of surrealism offered a challenge to get beyond the mundane and beneath the visible surface. Welding was a technique that allowed for a certain amount of spontaneity, which meant that an artwork might, ref might possibly reflect unconscious processes. While these three arrived at different paths, arrived at welding by different paths, they each at some point became aware of the two pioneers who had already brought sculpture off the pedestal and expanded it in space. Works by two of the most significant innovator innovators in modern American art, David Smith and Alexander Calder, began to be visible uh, during, the 19, during the 1960s, I mean, during the 1930s. So this is a, a very early David Smith swung forms. And uh, about the late 40s, David Smith. And uh, th this one <laughs> is called Spectre Riding a Headless Horse. Uh, yeah. So uh, Smith started, he'd been a painter, it started with the idea of sculpture that could be narrative, it could even be um, like uh, a, 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 on a single plane, like this song of a, of a landscape. But, and his work was just beginning to be known. He had shown the, his medals for dishonor in the Willard Gallery in the late 30s, but, it just, uh, so, but there was this presence of one person doing welded sculpture that the, uh, the, uh, these younger artists uh, were aware of. And the other, of course, was um, Calder. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Lasso recalled first seeing Calder's work in 1934, not long after Calder had begun taking sculpture off the ground while introducing the element of time by suspending his pieces of cut out metal in such a way that they shifted almost imperceptibly in constantly changing relationships. And this is uh, Calder's spider and four uh, directions. And then there were the painters. <laughs> closely associated with the sculptors in exhibitions and artists' organizations, especially the artists' club, during this time when gestural abstraction was at its zenith. This is a, a, just a brush drawing of, of Philip Guston's. Uh, the possibility of spontaneous creation in the welding process gave sculptors something analogous to what their painter friends, like Philip Guston, were doing with paint. Now, to look a little more closely at Seymour Lipton. John Brown, this is his uh, John Brown and the Fugitive Slave. Seymour Lipton was a practicing dentist when he started carving in wood, usually subjects related to social issues of the 30s. The first piece he exhibited was Lynched, shown at the John Reed Club in 1933. And his first one-man show was at the Left Wing ACA Gallery in 1938. John Brown and the Fugitive Slave of 1940 was characteristic of his wood carving and his concern with social justice. While teaching at the New School, he saw a show of works on paper by surrealists Miro and Masson and was inspired to follow a more subjective approach through modeling in plaster, with more hands-on uh, kind of work, which was then given a metallic coating, uh, usually lead. Um, uh, and th this warrior, his warrior of 1947, reflects the lingering impact of World War One and uh, World War Two, excuse me, and the horrors revealed at its end. My art, Lipton said, must meet the challenge of contemporary life. <clears throat> 
Lipton's sculpture was produced in a small room off the living room of his Grand Concourse apartment until he moved to, finally to an Upper West Side brownstone in the late 60s. That small room housed gas tanks and anvil, sheets of metal, uh, mostly Monel, and out, which is an alloy of steel and copper, uh, welding equipment, and a growing number of sculptures in progress. He made detailed preparatory perspective drawings, then drew on sheet metal the basic shapes that he cut out with heavy shears. Uh, the cut pieces were hammered or bent using an anvil and tacked into place, then spot brazed at the joints uh, and covered with a brazing metal, typically nickel silver. The technique lent itself to the juxtaposition of open and closed forms, frequently suggested by forms in nature, like milkweed pods. He had been drawn to organic growth, uh, to plant forms and insects as a child, playing in an empty field across from his Bronx home. Uh, this uh, uh, Seymour Lipton work is called uh, Prisoners. It, there was a international competition uh, f for a sculpture in 1950 or 51, a uh, sculpture on the theme of the unknown political prisoner. This is only you know, a half a decade after the end of the uh, Second World War. And uh, there were th 3,000 entries. And uh, so we have many, many uh, sculptures uh, appearing uh, at that time that deal with the uh, idea of the prisoner in, in one form or another. It was actually won by, in England by an English sculptor named Reg Butler and in the United States by Naum Gabo. So this was just uh, Lipton's uh, uh, version of a, the political prisoner. And this is an uh, early uh, welded piece of his called Equinox, in which he has used uh, forms of, of the moon and earth and uh, uh, the suggestion of uh, uh, a mountainous uh, uh, landscape and um, uh, tried to approximate a, some a situation in, in nature, which was his uh, an underlying theme in a lot of his work. Um, he, he, I sought, he said, to make sculpture as an evolving entity, to make a thing suggesting a process. There's these harsh tensions, dramatic or lyrical, are a basic reality in man. This is the realism I'm trying to get in sculptural language. This uh, piece is uh, um, getting a little larger in size, it's about six feet, and it's called um, uh, spring, spring Ceremony. And uh, here he now is actually raising uh, over his base metal, let's be sculpt the alchemist turning base metal to gold, um, using uh, a um, uh, nickel silver or a, bron a bronze alloy or something uh, as a thin coating over a met met sheet metal underpinning. And the sheet metal lent itself wonderfully to the kind of curving forms that that Lipton uh, wanted to get used, and then he could transform that uh, by uh, brazing a um, more polished metal over it. Uh, this is a Lip another Lipton sculpture called Sanctuary. Uh, this, uh, and it's very much his, his became his, his um, uh, core kind of uh, form, a, a, an enclosing, protecting form with hollows, uh, hollows uh, inside and something that's already half hidden uh, and secret. There is actually, there's a wonderful, uh, at least I think it is, um, sculpture of, of Lipton's in the corner of Avery Fisher Hall lobby, David Geffen Hall lobby, uh, called Archangel. A, a very, a very beautiful, large piece. Uh, Lincoln Center was a, a kind of a, a bonanza for uh, sculptors uh, during the uh, 60s when the, the architects were given a, a certain, uh, they were required to have a certain percentage of their budget uh, for artwork. So there, a number of artists uh, were given commissions to, for works in Lincoln Center. <coughs> And here is another small um, braised uh, Lipton sculpture called Jungle Bloom. And this is, it, I mentioned that uh, in 1956, there was a 12 Americans show at the Museum of Modern Art. 
And uh, there were, uh, both uh, Lipton and uh, Lassau had galleries to themselves in that show. These were special exhibitions that were held every five or six years, usually curated by Dorothy Miller, who was an uh, associate curator, associate of Alfred Barr. And um, uh, she would pick uh, an interesting sort of cross-section of artists for this, and it was a great honor to be one of the uh, 12 Americans. Later, a few years later, um, Stankevich was um, chosen for a 16 Americans show in 1958. Um, And Lipton also began exhibiting his work regularly at the Betty Parsons Gallery, along with Jackson Pollock and, and Barnett Newman. And uh, his work is growing more complex and more open. This is called Odyssey. And I think this is really a, a, a lovely piece, if you think of it, as it, uh, because it, he was uh, so much a um, formalist kind of abstraction and idea that you didn't have uh, subject matter, the form was enough. But Lipton remained someone uh, interested in the subject, and I love the, the, uh, uh, the curving, crisscrossing uh, uh, voyage of uh, Ulysses uh, that he uh, deals with in this wonderful open form sculpture. Uh, and natural forms, again, inspired glowworm and the more menacing mandrake of 1958. A mandrake is a Mediterranean plant of the nightshade family with a large forked root and soporific and narcotic properties. Lipton was probably drawn by its mythical and Jungian associations. As mentioned earlier, Jung's theories of a collective unconscious were a recurrent subject of artists' conversations and one of the tributaries to the ethos of abstract expressionism. In, in April of 1951, Joseph Campbell, Jungian scholar and author of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, lectured at the Artists' Club on myth and creative art. It was an appealing idea that in following whatever emerged during the working process, the artist was tapping into an age-old source of collective experience. And this is something that I think is not brought up enough in dealing with the 1950s. There was so much, uh, there were you know, powerful uh, critics of a Marxist background who didn't think that we needed subject matter or mystery or uh, any, anything like that and talked about art only in formalist terms. Uh, but the artists, a lot of them, were going to hear a wonderful Zen Buddhist uh, professor at Columbia named Suzuki. Uh, they went to hear uh, and, um, Oh, Krishnamurti, when he was at, would be speaking in New York, uh, they were very interested in Jung, and uh, I think everybody read uh, this Joseph Campbell book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So there was a, there is also this kind of searching that is not brought out very much. Um, this is a larger, much larger uh, Lipton piece called uh, called Sentinel. Um, uh, and as uh, sales and commissions proliferated, there was an incentive to work on a larger scale. Uh, the powerful protective sentinel of 1959 reaches almost eight feet. Later, he completed a 16 by 20 foot outdoor piece for the MIT campus and a number of commissions for synagogues and public spaces. Arctic bird, Again, okay, Lipton, perhaps, perhaps sculptors are especially drawn to birds as subjects, finding formal possibilities in their angled wings and streamlined forms in flight. Lipton's Arctic bird projects a sense of motion in the doubled wings, but at the same time, the metal unfurls over a partially, con over a partially concealed interior hollows in his characteristic contrast between gleaming surfaces and shadowy inner spaces. Scroll of 1960. By the end of the 50s decade, one has the sense that Lipton had fully, had become fully the master of his complex medium. There is a powerful forward momentum to scroll uh, that is countered by the repeated swirling circular motion. But scroll is more than just a sheet of metal made to unfurl in space. 
Clearly, for Lipton, it was intended to be evocative of ancient writings, the power of written words passed down over millennia in, the, in this uh, ancient form. In his book, Beyond Modern Sculpture, artist and critic Jack Burnham wrote, for sheer formal inventiveness, a single American sculptor has outdistanced his contemporaries on both sides of the Atlantic, Seymour Lipton. He is probably one of the best of the vitalists in the modern tradition. By vitalism, he meant something akin to Bergson's Elan Vital, a mysterious force that could not be entirely reduced to mechanistic explanation, and which could infuse art forms with a sense of life. Lipton's sinuous forms and gleaming surfaces may have been seductive, but for him, sculpture was primarily a vehicle for serious and far-ranging thought. In the course of exploring different systems of belief, he studied Zen, Zen Buddhism with Suzuki at Columbia for several years. Uh, at, the, at the dinner parties he liked to give for artists in his Bronx apartment, he would try to promote discussions among his guests by introducing philosophical questions and subjects. For him, the physical process of making was bound up with the expression of a form of philosophical questioning. On one of my visits to Lasso's studio in 1954, he read the following quotation from his copy of Jung's uh, Psychology and Alchemy. The attitude of mind, this is from Jung, uh, the attitude of mind with which the alchemist approached, approached his tax, task was all important. Achievement came not by force feeding or passion, but by humility and patience and perfect love. He must have a free and receptive mind. The mind must be in harmony with the work. The sculptor's kinship with the alchemist lies in the intermixture of material and spiritual goals. The transformation of the substance parallels the transformation of the spirit. It's a very interesting book, although reading it, just dipping back into it just recently, it seems it's extremely uh, dated. Ibram Lassau describes a working process very different from the perspective drawings and scale maquettes that preceded Lipton's sculpture. He maintained that intuition and instinct were the most fruitful way for his work to evolve. When I am welding a sculpture, no conscious ideas intrude, uh, intrude themselves into the work. I have eyes only for the reality of what happens before me. Um, what, ha what was happening before him was almost a dematerialization of the material substance. Um, excuse me. Droplets of various metals fused to thin rods by the flame of an oxyacetylene torch both reflected and refracted light from their irregular surfaces. The effect was in, enhanced by minute glinting color variations resulting from different, differing combinations of metals and, or the application of acids, acids. In contrast to Lipton's relatively solid and self-contained work in cut sheet metal with brazing applied, Ibram Lasso made brazed metal itself the main structural component of his spacious three-dimensional grids. His was a sculpture of relativity, a living organism of parts, ultimately in ecological interdependence. His pieces generally start with thin metal rods onto which he drifts small gobs of bronze or other metals from, rod, from a rod held in one hand while the other hand holds the uh, oxacetylene torch that melts the metal and fuses it to the support. I should mention that this oxacetylene torch was perfected during uh, the Second World War, or greatly improved, and it is under very high pressure. It fuses two, gas, two forms of gas, which have to be kept in the studio in tanks. Um, and in this process, it produces a flame uh, th that is as hot as over 5,000 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, 5,700, I believe, something like that. So you're working. Uh, I, in doing this, you're working with something that is extremely uh, precarious and um, needs absolutely uh, focused attention, plus goggles and leather gloves and so on. Uh, 
materials that he used to fuse onto the uh, uh, basic rods were uh, brass, nickel silver, silicon bronze, stainless steel, um, and, and uh, other metals that yield greens, blues, and reddish colors, which give the irregular surfaces a gem-like quality, the use of acids to mod using acids to modify the colors. My sculpture reflects the universe as a total organism made up of interrelated components, a continuum of forces in space. He used celestial titles in order to avoid anything that would suggest a reference to an actual subject. Watching his hands move as the flame darted and the sculpture grew, droplet by droplet, it was impossible not to see the association the artist made with alchemy. Clearly, he was moved by the idea of the artist as alchemist on a spiritual as much as a material quest. I let the work grow. Too much planning prejudices the growth. He saw his evolving three-dimensional grids as networks made up of energy transactions, galactic clusters, and subatomic particles, reflecting the growing awareness at mid-century of atomic structure. Such terms as relativity and E equals MC square had become part of the vocabulary. Lassau was born to Sephardic parents in Egypt, where even as a small child, he found material for modeling, clay, modeling in clay pits outside Alexandria. Later in New York, he shaped small animals out of hot tar uh, when First Avenue was being paved. By chance, at the Brooklyn Children's Museum, he discovered a clay class. With a group of young enthusiasts, the teacher rented a larger space, which moved then to 8th Street in Manhattan, where it became the Sculpture Center, uh, which today thrives in Queens. The exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of Catherine Dreyer's Societe Anonyme collection in 1927 made a deep impression on Lasso, implanting a lasting dedication to abstract art. The 1930s were spent in exploring abstract principles, especially influenced by Calder, uh, to open up the sculptural mass, as in, sorry, uh, as in this untitled work of 1937. It was very advanced for 1937. Um, and he was one of the founders of abstract American artists, serving as its, as its president for six years. In 1949, there was a meeting in his loft that marked the founding of the Artists Club, where artist members gathered for weekly panels and discussions for the next 10 years. The dealer, Sam Coots, saw his sculpture in the 1951 Museum of Modern Art exhibition and showed his work for the next 15 years. Philip Johnson commissioned a beautiful, um, excuse me, Philip Johnson, commissioned a, a very beautiful hanging piece called Clouds of Magellan for the partially subterranean guest house next to his famous glass house in New Canaan, Connecticut. So this is hanging in a, in a, a very enclosed space under a kind of arched uh, or vaulted ceiling and with, uh, above the bed. And it's a much more colorful and gleaming uh, piece than, than shows up in this photograph. Um, then there were other synagogue commissions, and um, there is, a, there is a, a temple Bethel in um, Springfield, Massachusetts, commissioned a 28-foot high uh, pillar of fire, which is installed on the outside of, of the building, and then many uh, religious pieces for the uh, interior, a, a wonderful menorah and other uh, objects connected with uh, the ritual. All right, I think that's about it. For, oh, there's, there is a very 28-foot uh, lasso piece at the Jewish Museum. It's, un, it's not hanging now, but it was made. Um, his, his work was very much in demand for in religious buildings uh, it went, and went well with uh, very uh, simple modern architecture. Um, so this piece at the Jewish Museum was a, a wall panel, 28-foot long, uh, that was to hang above the platform from which the Torah is read. Writing about his father, Peter Stankevich also sees a connection to alchemy. I think of welding as a kind of alchemy. Uh, this, is, this is quoting from 
Stankevich's son, Peter. I think of his welding as a kind of alchemy, and the welding mask or goggles as the attributes of the master who controls the fire and the secrets of the craft. Richard Stankevich was two years old when his Polish-born father, excuse me, Um, when his Polish-born father was killed by a train when crossing a Philadelphia railroad switchyard. His mother, who married at least three more times, took him and his siblings to live with relatives in Detroit, where he grew up a half mile from a vast industrial dumping field with mountains of burnt out slag that children would climb on. After graduating from a leading technical high school, he was offered a fellowship at Cranbrook Academy, but he could not afford to accept it. He enlisted in the Navy where he became a radio operator and served for six years, much of the time at a remote post in the Aleutian Islands. Transferred to a station near Puget Sound, he visited Seattle museums and encountered the work of Morris Graves and Mark Toby, and then made his first outdoor paintings on canvas board during a two-year posting in Hawaii. After his discharge from the Navy in Hawaii, he hired out on a sailboat that took 25 days to reach the United States, <clears throat> and then hitchhiked across the country to New York, and, like numerous other veterans, took advantage of the GI Bill and gravitated to the Hans Hoffman School. Becoming more interested in sculpture than painting, he traveled to Paris with fellow Hoffman student, Jean Follett, and spent six months enrolling in the, enrolled in the atelier of Ossip Zagkin. I had sculpture in the back of my mind, an urge to make a tangible, physical, 3D thing, and I wasn't a very good painter. Um, and so this is what he modeled at the time he was working, uh, avoiding working from the model and, and, and um, modeling by hand in a lump of, pl of clay or plaster at Zadkin's studio. Um, he refused to work from the model with the other students, but went into a small separate room, modeling a lump of clay, uh, creating cavities and hollows in plaster. After their return to the United States, Stankevich and Follett were approached by former Hoffman students, uh, Wolf Kahn and Felix Facilis, who asked them to join forces to found a cooperative gallery. Without them, uh, Wolf Kahn told me recently, there would have been no Hansa Gallery. Uh, which, along with the tanager, marked the beginning of the artist's co-op scene on East 10th Street, which was so nicely recollected in that exhibition at the Gray Art Gallery last year. Um, the, thing, the things that he returned from Paris with were simply small wire figures, uh, some of them covered in plaster, and this is what he first showed at the Hansa Gallery uh, co-op. Um, there was a small... Um, yard behind the building that Stankevich moved into on Bond Street. In hopes of starting a, <clears throat> a garden, he began to dig in its hardened soil. He tossed aside pieces of rusted old metal, but later, as he tells it, became intrigued by their shapes. And he began to uh, pick up these shapes and look at them and see possibilities in them. This is a very basic eight-inch uh, f figure, uh, one of the er his early uh, uses of, of found uh, old metal. Uh, and you, you can see, just staring at a bolt, he begins to see a possibility. He puts on a washer that becomes a, ha a hinge, that, uh, little pipes for arms, and so forth. Very simple. Uh, but this is, I show it because it sort of gives you an idea of the basic of the beginning of his pieces made of... Uh, scrap metal. And uh, in those days, this is we're talking about for 1954, 55, uh, city housekeeping wasn't particularly good and there was a lot of uh, old metal, rusted machines, and discarded uh, <coughs> equipment of one kind or another, just lying around in vacant lots. And so he would be able to pick up uh, pieces and, and uh, see if he could do something with them. Uh, and but pretty soon, city housekeeping got better, and he actually had a junk dealer, a uh, scrap metal dealer, who became interested in his work and would save him choice pieces that he thought could be turned into sculpture. Anyway, this is a piece from about 1954 uh, called Tribal, Tribal um, Chart. And here he was, he, he, it's like a family tree. I mean, it's sort of the general idea. And all these separate little pieces, 
if, if you could look at if, if I had close-up detail, they each is a, a particular persona and, uh, and re share different characteristics, one, one with the other. It's actually a very witty, clever uh, piece. And this is uh, called Family Group. And this is called The Marriage Cart. Uh, and uh, he had, he was a very, he wasn't a big talker, but he was, had a wonderful, dry sense of humor and uh, was very good at, uh, he was very interested in, in, uh, in satire and, and even burlesque in, in terms of the way he chose the pieces in his, for his sculpture. Um, And sometimes, this is uh, King and Queen, about 1956. Uh, uh, so there are some pieces that are just wonderfully, just from an aesthetic point of view, not, and you don't think about them so much as scrap metal. And th this, if you look and see what he's done with the, with the curving pieces here and how, how uh, intricately interwoven the two figures, the two royal figures are. He may have had some satire in mind also about you know, when the uh, emptiness of kings and queens or whatever. But, um, and this is called Aurora not Aurora, Europa, on a bicycle. And uh, whether he actually had in mind uh, Titian's rape of Europa or not, I don't know. But this is, a, uh, if in, in the Titian, Europa is very precariously poised on the back of the bull that's carrying, carrying her away. Uh, Zeus describing, disguised as a bull. So uh, here, Europa on a bicycle, uh, we have an equally precarious uh, situation, and it, it, it's quite an amazing work if you look and you see that a whole, this whole conglomeration of pieces is balanced on one rim of, of one wheel and, and uh, moves at an, <coughs> an angle into space that has a real uh, dynamic to it. And one of the favorite pieces in his um, exhibition at the Stable Gallery in the late, uh, late 50s was this kabuki, kabuki dancer. Uh, which was his tallest work to, uh, to, to that date, with tiny moving feet and an elegant sway. Um, she was evidently inspired by the visit of Japanese dancers to New York. It's amazing how much expression he could get out of, uh, of these randomly, random pieces of old metal. Um, This is called Speckled Bird Shy. It did a number of bird pieces, and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Emmy Donati, who wrote the uh, uh, major book on Stankiewicz, uh, thought he very much identified, because he was somewhat shy himself, with this uh, little one uh, speckled bird standing on one leg. And this is fish, fish lurking. In the Aleutians, Stankiewicz had written in a small notebook that he never tired of peering into the depths of the sea with its ceaselessly moving forms of moats and microorganisms. The peculiar posture of the convincing being, the stance of being about to move, the tension between the parts of a whole are qualities that pull us to a special object. In 19... Oh, I should just mention this one. Uh, this is called The Candidate of 1960. Uh, deliberately unappealing, the scowling candidate with its dark imperviousness, bulbous nose, and microphone body bears a distinct resemblance to an actual candidate of the time. Uh, in 1960, the Swedish curator Pontus Holten commissioned Stankiewicz to make a, a piece for a show of kinetic sculpture that he was curating in Stockholm. The result was apple, sometimes described as a monument to frustration, since the round object set in motion when a quarter was inserted into the machine eluded both the grasping hands of the tank figure on the right and the jaws uh, of the standing figure on the left. With each new quarter deposited, the tantalizing swinging of the apple again thwarted the attempts at capture, suggesting a kinship with the bachelors of Duchamp's large glass. And then 
things changed. <laughs> he moved to the country, he uh, began teaching at an upstate uh, university, and uh, his works became large and uh, more substantial, and um, actually, he was in Australia, uh, his, he was married to a woman from Australia at that time, and, and uh, he was in Australia, and they, and they set him up in a factory where they had a lot of Corten steel, and he began working on a large scale in Corten, and it really leads to a whole different uh, chapter in his work. This is a, just a transitional, untitled piece. It's about seven feet high, so he's in more into a monumental thing, and, and eventually transi transitioned away from the scrap metal so, back to flames. Um, in 1959, the Swiss sculptor Jean Tanguelli filled a room of the Stamfli Gallery in New York with rattling and shaking kinetic metal sculptures, all more or less humanoid. In 1960, Tanguelli arrived here with the intention uh, to construct in the garden of the Museum of Modern construct a large sculpture in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art. He contacted Stankevich, who put him in touch with his scrap metal dealer, and while Billy Kluver and other friends scoured the suburban dumping grounds for discarded wheels, appliances, etc., Incorporated into this piece, which took three weeks to put together, were 60 bicycle wheels and more than 50 other wheels, an automatic piano, two smaller independently moving vehicles, and a writing machine with a roll of paper on which the process of self-destruction was to be recorded. At the end of three weeks, all was ready, and on the night of March 17, 1960, before an invited audience in the Museum of Modern Art's backyard, Tangeli set his machine in motion. A great deal of clanging, thumping, and screeching, along with flames and billowing smoke, ensued. However, when the flames appeared to be totally out of control, firemen who had been standing by turned on their hoses, and the end result was the uh, charred remains of a half-consumed machine, uh, some fragments of which are now exhibited as artworks. I've, t I've tended to see an optimistic symbolism in this aborted act of self-destruction. The destroying machine we have set in, we have set in motion um, may possibly be halted by some mischance before destruction is total. In any case, there's a filmed record of the event by Billy Kluver and another by Robert Breer. There's a sad postscript to this story. By the end of the decade, here is Irving Sandler, the official chronicler of the downtown art world in the 1950s, writing in the Evergreen Review, quote, among the diverse tendencies in advanced American sculpture, metal construction claims a proportionately large number of devotees. So many of them are imitators or taste merchants that metal work in itself can no longer be considered the emblem of the avant-garde. Clement Greenberg, although an ardent champion of David Smith, had no tolerance for direct metal work in general, and he dismissed it as garden sculpture and massive jewelry. Now this offers an example of the new speeded up momentum of change that has afflicted American art since the mid 20th century. A demonstration of how rapidly experiment and innovation can turn into instant vogues and how quickly the novelties may descend to museum basements and languish in storage warehouses. However, one of the uh, advantages of sculpture, and that could be true of the metal sculpture, uh, is that it hangs around. And uh, before long, sooner or later, a lot of this quite wonderful uh, and bold and inventive work of the 50s will resurface in museum collections and private collections and, and uh, hopefully be in, enjoyed and appreciated. Okay. That is that.